Hey, Godfather fans, welcome to the first non-Sopranos related episode here on Sopranos Street. As some of you may know, I was going to put any non-Sopranos related things on a different channel, but I decided against that, so let's start with a Machiavellian Monday. I will be back on The Sopranos later this week, however, with an episode examining Dr. Melfi. More specifically, why did she really dump Tony as a patient? Anyways, on to this episode. In this episode of Machiavellian Monday, we will focus on the iconic Vito Corleone. Now, Machiavelli's book The Prince is known to have had a tremendous impact on mob culture. It's referenced in TV shows, practically quoted in a Bronx tale, and even Carlo Gambino is known to have referenced Machiavelli's Lion and the Fox example as one to be followed by leaders. But Machiavellianism is actually much more specific than many people know. It's not just a general notion that you should scheme your way to the top and that the ends justify the means. It's essentially a how-to-rule manual for current or aspiring leaders, detailing the most effective ways to deal with specific circumstances and different type of people based on Machiavelli's historical observations. So when doing evaluations for Machiavellian Mondays, I will be looking at how they acted in certain situations uh, compared to how Machiavelli said they should act, and not just deciding who was the best schemer. Also, when dealing with The Godfather specifically, pieces from both the books and the movies may come into play. When evaluating Don Vito from a Machiavellian standpoint, the earliest we can really start is when he decided to take on Don Finucci. During this time, we can take a look at how Machiavellian he was in his implementation of a conspiracy, as well as his actions to win over the populace. From there, we can evaluate how Machiavellian he was in his use of the money he now had rolling in, as well as his understanding of the context behind it. We can also evaluate his use of his right-hand man, focusing on Sonny, but we can't really get an understanding of Vito's use of takeover strategy until we look at the Maranzano Wars, since Finucci was essentially a one-man band. When dealing with Finucci, Machiavelli asserts that, with a few exceptions, it is better to be bold than cautious, for good fortune is like a woman, a lover of men with the audacity to command her, and Vito was bold. Now, how he determined Finucci was a fraud is irrelevant in the context of this episode. Wise guys don't carry the money in a wallet. But it is interesting to note that Finucci immediately backpedals on his word. A very un-Machiavellian move, as his strategy dictates that a prince show in his dealings that his word is irrevocable. Vito, by contrast, becomes known as a man of his word. Machiavelli also points out that there is nothing more perilous or uncertain of success than trying to install a new order of things. You will find enemies with all those who did well under the old system and only lukewarm friends with people who might do better under yours. But here's the thing. Nobody did well under Finucci except Finucci. He had no muscle behind him and the locals hated him. Now, since Machiavellian wisdom states that conspiracies rely on the consent of the people and that men will change leadership willingly if it betters themselves, Machiavellian strategy dictates that he needs only kill the old leaders and he will fear no aftermath. This is exactly what Vito did, and he quickly gained the respect of the neighborhood. For when people expect to be treated cruelly and instead are treated mildly, it will gain tremendous favor. As his influence grew, his actions continued to line up perfectly with those described in The Prince. He became the protector of his weaker neighbors, which prevented his enemies from easily infiltrating, as he now had eyes everywhere. He was also not viewed as a rapacious violator of people's property, like Fiducci had been, and what Machiavelli states is the worst thing a leader can be. As a result of Vito's exceptional running of his operation, the money came flowing in. The interesting thing when it comes to the use of money, however, is that Machiavelli states not to be generous with your own money only that of other people, but in the mob life pretty much everything they have is someone else's, so Vito did the Machiavellian thing and started throwing money around. In doing so, he gained even more influence and connections, but he never lost sight of the fact that if someone's relationship with you is based on their personal ambitions, then their motives can never be trusted. Your father did business with Hyman Roth. Your father respected Hyman Roth, but your father never trusted Hyman. With a firm organization under his control, we can now look at how Vito's use of his right-hand man compares to with how Machiavelli says they should be used, and we will focus on Sonny. 
Now, this will not be a perfect parallel because Machiavelli wasn't referring to a government structured exactly like the mob, but it's close enough that an analysis can be done. From a Machiavellian standpoint, Sonny is an excellent number two. Aside from the fact that his loyalty was based on affection, not ambition, his legendary temper made him perfect for the role of a stern governor that allows the prince to distance himself from boldness and be viewed as the mild one. This further allows the prince to leave matters of reproach, which may breed contempt, in the hands of management, while keeping matters of grace in their own hands. Now, while this may be all fine and good that, knowingly or not, Vito acted in line with Machiavellian strategy when taking out a phony gangster or navigating relatively smooth waters, but how would he stack up when faced with an opponent of comparable size and influence? To examine that, we will take a look at the war between the Corleones and the Maranzanos that kicked off after the end of Prohibition. After the partnership proposed by the Corleones was rejected by the Maranzanos, a war began to escalate and Maranzano reached out to Al Capone for help. This was not a Machiavellian move by Maranzano because you should never use hired help if you intend to conquer, because even if you win, you will become their captive. It is better to lose with your own soldiers than to win with others. Either way, that's what Maranzano did, and Vito's response, again, falls right in line with Machiavellian strategy. After having Lucas Brasi... Luca Brasi... Luca. Sorry, after having Luca Brasi take care of the guy sent by Capone, he sends Capone a note which attempts to make a friend out of a powerful figure, but also firmly letting Capone know where he stands if he doesn't accept. And he accepted. With Capone out, Vito is free to go on the offensive, which he does to great success and very much in line with the strategies outlined in The Prince. That strategy dictates that you must first ruin them, which he did through a series of attacks and allowing his people to switch sides rather than killing them. The prince states not only that he should not kill them, but he should let them live exactly how they did before and only draw tribute from them, which is exactly what Vito did. Lastly, you must kill the old ruler and make friends of the old influencers, which, surprise surprise, Vito does. He sways Maranzano's captains into giving up their boss for execution, and with his death, Vito has secured his victory. All he has to do now is treat people well, which he is known for, and Machiavelli states that their loyalties will change quickly. In the end, Vito Corleone is an incredibly Machiavellian character, much more so than his son Michael, who will be the subject of another Machiavellian Monday, and followed his strategies, knowingly or not, very well. Well, thanks for watching another Machiavellian Monday here on Soprano Street. As always, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you at the next score.